It's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker here at Porkfest 2015. This is our 12th annual event. Philip Stinson is a professor of criminal justice at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. He just drove up all the way to be with us today. I read about him in an article that was related to police misconduct, which is an issue that's dear to my heart. I think it's a really important issue and one that is finally gaining mainstream media attention. Phil manages the largest police misconduct database in America, so he's the guy who has the numbers. He's been featured on CNN and Anderson Cooper and is cited widely in the Washington Times and the Post. <laughs> um, he is also a former police officer who uh, worked in New Hampshire from 1986 to 1988. And the reason I personally chose to bring him out was because he said the following. When I went to New Hampshire, I saw some shit. It really changed my outlook. Police misconduct, transparency, and accountability is something that is very important to a free society. We should be changing everyone's outlook because it is an in for us to spread more of our ideas about many other things. So please join me in welcoming Philip Stinson. Well, good afternoon and, and thanks for the invitation. This is a place that I really do consider home. Uh, although I grew up in Northern Virginia, outside Washington, D.C. Uh, grew up in Northern Virginia, outside Washington, D.C., but my family spent our summer vacations up here, about 10 miles from here in Whitefield. And I can't remember the first summer we came up here, but to give you some idea of my age, I do remember one evening sitting out in the family station wagon, listening on the AM radio in Whitefield when President uh, Nixon resigned. So, yeah, so it's a long time ago. So, uh, uh, and I think my interest in law enforcement really comes from that era. I do remember in Whitefield in the mid-70s, the police chief was named Guy Lalonde. His daughter, Melissa, was the most beautiful girl in the North Country. And uh, I developed a real interest in law enforcement. And I was a college student at George Mason University in Virginia. And I decided that when I graduated, I wanted to move back up to New Hampshire. And I did work in uh, Dover, New Hampshire, as a police officer for, for several years before I went back to DC to go to law school. Um, and one thing I will say about police officers in New Hampshire is that New Hampshire does have some of the best training for law enforcement officers in the country. Every full-time police officer in New Hampshire goes to the New Hampshire Police Academy. It's the same training that we had in Dover that state police officers have, that officers in Littleton, that officers in Whitefield have. So it's a very good system. That being said, I did see some shit that really opened my eyes when I was a police officer. And it's something that I thought about for many years. Uh, due process became something that was very interesting to me. And then uh, uh, I did go to law school. I actually worked at a libertarian think tank and public interest law firm in Washington, D.C. for several years as a fellow, the Center for Individual Rights. Ended up practicing law for about a decade and decided that I'd live a lot longer if I wasn't a litigator. So I went back to school, got a master's and a, and a, and a Ph.D. in criminology. And it was when I was in uh, grad school that I really developed an interest uh, formally in police misconduct, and more specifically, police crime. That is crime that's committed by sworn law enforcement officers. And I realized then, and it's the same situation now, that the federal government does not track any crime by police officers or police misconduct. There are no statistics that are available from the federal government. No federal agencies do a good job of tracking this. So I had decided to come up with a methodology where I could track police crime, and that's what I want to talk to you about uh, today. So... It, so in terms of uh, the literature and uh, research that's been done in the past on police crime, we really don't know a whole lot about the crimes by police officers. We do know from some independent commissions uh, some problems with very specific police departments. For example, uh, every 20 years or so, the shit hits the fan in the NYPD in New York City, and there's an independent commission. They're due for one right about now. The... Uh, uh, the Mullen Commission was in 1994 or so, the Knapp Commission in the early 70s, and it goes back from there. Also, the Pennsylvania Crime Commission in the early 1970s uh, found out a lot about crime by police officers in, uh, in Philadelphia. Interesting thing, uh, Arlen Specter, the late senator from Pennsylvania, was then the district attorney in the city and county of Philadelphia, and he went out of his way to interfere with the state uh, crime commission 
uh, kept them from learning about crime and corruption in the Philadelphia Police Department. Another way that we know about crime from police officers is through investigative reporting. So the New York Times has done a lot over the years, the Boston Globe and the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I had an opportunity, I'll tell you a little bit more about it a little later, to work with uh, investigative reporters from the Washington Post to do some specific research on police shootings uh, over the last 10 years or so. And then there's research by criminologists. And I think the one that, that stands out the most for me is the work done by Albert J. Rice. He had a book that was published in 1972 called The Police and the Public. And it was observational research of police misconduct, or actually observational research of police officers at work in several large cities in the late 60s and early 70s. And the thing that struck me about that research was in the presence of researchers, on-duty police officers, about 22% of them committed crimes in the presence of the researchers. And that really struck me as something that was interesting. And then Jim Fife, who uh, passed away about a decade ago, studied career-ending misconduct in the NYPD. And I think of my research sort of as a, as a, a stepping off point from Fife's and expanding upon his research. So the methodology, uh, my research is primarily a quantitative content analysis. In other words, we analyze various things and run various statistical operations to try to make some findings. Um, and the way I developed my research methodology, realizing that there wasn't anything available, I decided in 2004 to use Google Alerts. And if you're familiar with Google Alerts, you can set up uh, search terms and it just let it rip. It'll run a constant search of the Google search engine. And in this case, I set up searches that would run uh, constant searches crawling the Google News search engine. That is the search engine that drives traffic to the Google News page. So I wasn't interested in that page, but the search engine that drives traffic to it. So since that time, uh, that was the end of 2004, since that time I have developed uh, data and kept data on about 1,100 cases each year where non-federal sworn law enforcement officers across the country are arrested. So in my research, most of what we're talking about, the unit of analysis criminal arrest case. In other words, it's not officers arrested, but it's criminal arrest case. So when officers arrested for three rapes, each one of those rapes we would count as a separate case because we're interested in the criminal case outcomes and things like that, and we want to track the individual cases. So there are strengths and limitations of the research. In terms of the limitations of the research, obviously we're limited by the the scope of the information that we have that's available to us. Um, all of the cases that I'm dealing with, there's been an official arrest. So what really interests me the most, I can't study, which is crime that law enforcement officers are not arrested for. And we do know that a lot of police officers are fired from their jobs uh, and they're not arrested. And one of the reasons for that is under a 1967 Supreme Court case, Garrity versus New Jersey, if a police officer is required to give a statement or lose their job, uh, that's a coerced statement, and they can't use it against them criminally if they're going to use it against them administratively to fire them. So that does keep some officers uh, become, uh, from being arrested. And then also, there's a process where the media gets to pick and choose what officers they mention, what articles they write, what gets on the Internet, what makes it into the newspaper. It seems, though, that we've proven the point that police crime is something that's newsworthy, and these articles tend to get into the paper and get reported on. So I do have some slides that I guess you can't really see from you where you are well, but in terms of the database that we built, I've had a lot of questions over the last few months specifically about the database. So when I went to Bowling Green State University in 2009, one of the things that I wanted to do was to get rid of a paper-based system and move to an automated system. So we were able to build a uh, object relational database. In other words, it has components of a relational database, uh, it also has components of an object-oriented database. So we have a digital imaging database, and I'll give you some examples. So this is a, a screenshot of the database of just looking at a new case login sheet. We still do that on paper where every one of the cases that my research assistants want to log in has to be approved by me at, a, at the rate of about 1,100 a year. And this is just a list of things that were in queue waiting to be indexed. In other words, once we scan documents into the database system, we have to tell it which file to put it in, literally. So it's an indexing process. And we've got uh, about half a million documents now in the database. You can't see this here, but this is one police officer who's actually been arrested nine, to nine times. Um, uh, and the ninth time he was arrested, it was by the feds, and they came in and got him on a Lautenberg Amendment uh, violation. In other words, if you're convicted 
of a qualifying misdemeanor crime of domestic violence, you cannot carry a firearm, you can't own a firearm, you can't possess your own ammunition. So I don't mention the names of officers in this research, but this was actually mentioned in the press a few months ago. This is an officer named John Lewis who was arrested nine times. He was an officer in Schenectady, New York. And if you look at the arrests over a several year period, you can see that his life was completely unraveling. There were obviously issues with mental health. There were obviously issues with uh, marital problems and divorce. There were obviously issues with alcoholism. And he got arrested for everything under the sun. Uh, everything that you can imagine. One of his arrests before he was fired was actually for breaking out the window in his jail cell. And who gets arrested for damaging their jail cell? It seems like they were just, uh, you know, uh, stacking it on at that point. Uh, oh, and by the way, one thing I should mention about him is we've seen this in a number of cases. It's a sad ending to his story. He killed himself, uh, 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 I believe, about a year ago or so. So, you know, some of these cases end in bad, very tragic ways. This is just a list of some of the cases from the San Diego Police Department to give you an idea of how the relational database works. This is an interesting case here. This just shows you a news article, but the headline is Cop Holds Wife Hostage Over Cake. And this was a New York police, uh, uh, police department lieutenant who headed up a domestic violence unit who completely lost it when his wife did not get him an ice cream cake for his 47th birthday. And he ended up uh, not only brandishing a firearm uh, but he also came at her with a hatchet or something like that. So the last time we checked, uh, we actually worked with a reporter at the New York Times who checked and found that at least as recently as about two or three years ago, this guy was still employed as a police officer. And the charges were dropped. Uh, we also try to get court records. We keep uh, all the court records that we can get. We try to triangulate our data sources so we have that sort of thing. We also uh, started about three years ago collecting videos from the news. So this is a, a news video, just a screenshot of it, of a news story out of Pittsburgh. Uh, and this is a case involving a state trooper in Pennsylvania named uh, Kevin Foley, who killed my dentist, uh, a guy named Yelenic. Uh, and Kevin is now uh, serving a life sentence in prison for murder. And then we've gone away from paper-based coding sheets. This is just a screenshot of one of the pages that tracks different offenses. We have 270 quantitative variables that we track now. So now we have an automated system where we have a computerized coding instrument. It pulls data and pre-fills data from our relational database, and it makes it a lot easier for us to uh, uh, code the cases now. So we've coded our data for seven years now. We have seven years of data. 2005 to 2011. We've been collecting new data since that time, again at the rate of about 1,100 cases a year, but we haven't fully coded those cases. So for the time period uh, 2005 through 2011, we have 6,724 arrest cases involving 5,545 individual police officers or sworn law enforcement officers. So that does include deputy sheriffs, state troopers, uh, what we used to call up here in New Hampshire, trout troopers, so fish and game wardens, things like that, uh, as well as tribal officers. Uh, they were employed by over 2,500 agencies in about 1,200 independent uh, or city or counties or independent cities. So the only place you have independent cities in the country, the Commonwealth of Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, St. Louis, Missouri, and Carson City, Nevada. Everywhere else, uh, cities are within counties. In all 50 states, and the District of Columbia. So that's a lot of cases, it's a lot of data. Uh, I didn't want to get heavy into the stats today, so I wanted to uh, you know, just give you some descriptive statistics. But if you look at this map here, this is uh, where we calculated the rate per 100,000 citizens of officers being arrested. So here we changed the unit of analysis to officer from arrest case, so that's a, an exception to our general procedure. Uh, and the darker red colors would be higher rates. And, and it's unfair in some ways to look at crime rates because here you can see the rural areas, it looks really, really bad. That may not be a whole lot of cases, but when you look at the rate per 100,000 citizens, the rates come out pretty high. Uh, and, and the only reason I calculated rates at all was that Kathy Lanier, the police chief of the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C., asked me to calculate rates because she was really getting mad at the Washington Times because they kept publishing articles suggesting that the uh, MPD was a worse police department than the Baltimore Police Department. So all she wanted me to prove was that they're not as bad as the Baltimore Police Department. Um, and it took me a while to do it, but we were able to prove that, and Chief Lanier seems happy with, the, with our finding. So 
Uh, one thing that I was told as a recruit at the New Hampshire Police Academy back almost 30 years ago now is that there's three things that will mess up your career as a police officer. Booze, broads, and bills. So I thought about that, and it was in the back of my head. And when I started to study crime by police officers, I, I developed a typology. Now, these are not mutually exclusive categories. They are different types of police crime. So one thing could be in one or more of these types. So almost all crime by police officers is alcohol-related, drug-related, sex-related, violence-related, and or profit-motivated crime. And we look at crime by police officers both on duty and off duty because there's no bright line. Cops have a hard time turning it off when they go home. They carry their badge, they carry their gun, and those two things become a part of them, and they really can't handle dealing with the great unwashed Americans. You know, they always get into neighborhood fights with people, you know, because they don't like the way they put out the trash can, all these different kinds of things. Um, so um, I want to go through some of these in some more detail. If I were to add a sixth category, there are a few cases that don't fall under any of these types, and that would be revenge-motivated police crime. We have a number of cases where police officers commit crimes for sport, where it's just for the purpose, seemingly, of fucking with somebody. And I don't know any other way to say that. That's a good legal term. Uh, uh, but that's just what we've seen in a number of cases. And I can give you some examples, but it's, it's the kinds of things that you would think. So not only revenge porn, but some very deliberate behaviors that are really quite creative in their criminality. Spite. What's that? Spite. Spite, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely spite. So we did a study on uh, officers... Uh, who were arrested for DUI. And one of the reasons this was an important study for me was that one of the things that we know about law enforcement officers are that law enforcement is exempt from law enforcement. That is to say, police officers don't like to arrest other officers. And I can tell you from my time as a police officer uh, here in New Hampshire that it was very, very rare, almost unheard of, that a cop would arrest another cop for drunk driving. It just didn't happen. So we had uh, roughly... 900 cases where we were looking at officers who were arrested for DUI. Why did they lose that exemption? And what we found was these cases were typically over the top. About half the cases uh, involved, actually more than half, 54%, involved the traffic accident. Some of the cases involved very serious injuries. And in about 20% of the cases, they involved a hit and run, where it's really interesting, where the officers realized, if I can make it home, uh, without getting caught. They can't get me for the DUI. They'll get me for the hit and run, but they're not going to get me for the drunk driving. So it's just amazing to me that we have so many officers who are, who are fleeing from accident scenes um, while they're drunk. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. By the way, I had a great ride over here from western Pennsylvania, or, uh, Ohio uh, this week. I got to about Buffalo and I realized, you know what? There's not a state trooper within 100 miles of here because they're all up on the border chasing around those two convicts, right? So I made record time from Buffalo to Albany, and it was the most fun I've had in a car since I was a teenager in New Hampshire. Um, so I want to take a look here at, uh, at some drug cases. So we looked at drug-involved crime, and one of the things about this research that's really interesting is this is the first research project that's had data from thousands of law enforcement agencies where officers have been arrested. The prior research just has a few agencies or just one agency. So we really don't know much about cops in terms of their drug crimes other than what the Knapp Commission and the Mullen Commission told us in the NYPD. So the Knapp Commission talked about uh, uh, grass eaters and uh, meat eaters. So the meat eaters were the officers who were involved in drug trade. The grass eaters were just the ones who were dealing in personal use. And the Mullen Commission found that by 1994, uh, police officers in New York who were involved in drugs were deep into the drug trade, and a lot of heroin and things like that. So some of the statistical operations we do are uh, decision tree analysis, where we use machine learning algorithms. And you can't really see this well, but here when we're dealing with cases involving selling, dealing, and trafficking drugs, the drug of choice of police officers who are arrested is cocaine. Um, it's cocaine, and then... Uh, marijuana, crack, and then heroin. Another thing we looked at was cases involving officers who uh, shake people down in traffic stops. 
uh, not only traffic stops, but sometimes uh, in uh, uh, stops with uh, drug dealers or go into their apartments or their houses, things like that. So we wanted to know in these cases where, frankly, they're robberies, these cases, where officers had drug-involved shakedowns, uh, the drug of choice here again is cocaine. And it's cocaine and marijuana uh, in dealing with the shakedown cases. And these are not typically personal use cases. We do have a number of cases involving um, uh, cocaine where there are um, crimes where they're giving these drugs to um, uh, sex workers. So as one of my graduate assistants once referred to, she said, well, that's uh, cocaine is stripper candy. Uh, and I didn't ask her any more questions about what she was talking about or how she knew that. So the drug crimes are a problem. What's a bigger concern are the sex-involved crimes. And here again, I apologize, it's hard to see this. But one of the things we found is that just over 50% of the victims in cases where law enforcement officers are arrested for sex crimes are juveniles. They're under the age of 18. Uh, and that's really troubling. And these are on-duty cases. We have a little bit older the victims. But the younger victims quite often are the off-duty cases. And we don't know what's going on there. It does seem that people, maybe a woman would be a little bit more lax around their new boyfriend because he's a police officer. They become more trusting. They let their guard down as a guardian, as a parent quicker. We're not sure what's going on. But we see some weird things. We see a lot of crimes with small children as the victims. But we also see kids at the age of 15. It just skyrockets at 15. I don't know if 15 is when you can go to the mall, if you still have malls, uh, by yourself or what. But boys and girls are sexually victimized by dirty cops and sex crimes uh, at staggering numbers in our research. So um, in terms of violence-related research, a few things that I want to mention there. Um, I did a study, as I mentioned earlier, with the Washington Post. It's the first time I've actually worked with uh, reporters. Uh, we weren't very trusting of each other when we started out. Uh, but over a period of about five months or so, we, we worked on a project that got national attention, frankly, international attention. It was published on the front page of the Washington Post on April 12th, a Sunday. And what we found was we were looking at, uh, we wanted to know the question, the answer to the question that everybody's been asking since the incident in Ferguson last summer, uh, which is how often are police officers arrested for on-duty shootings? Because we know that there are a lot of shootings involving police officers. We don't know exactly how many. I think about 1,000 to 1,200 a year. But I can tell you that from the beginning of 2005 through April 12th or April 11th, 2015, 2015, there were 54 officers who were arrested for shooting somebody to death on duty. And in those 54 cases, as of now, only 11 of the officers were convicted. 19 of the cases are still pending. And all the other cases, uh, they were found not guilty or the charges were dropped. So that's kind of an interesting number. Uh, and nobody else has data on that point. Um, another thing that we've looked into somewhat, and we're writing a paper on this now, is what Jim Fife referred to as bizarre violence. Bizarre violence is the crazy shit that cops do with guns off duty. So an example would be um, holding your 14-year-old stepdaughter at gunpoint because she failed a math quiz. Uh, things like that. Uh, pulling a gun on your wife because you didn't get an ice cream cake for your birthday. And we have literally um, many, many hundreds of cases where officers do things that you just can't imagine with firearms. I was, I was quite impressed, for example, here with the sheet on uh, etiquette for firearms at Porkfest. And those are rules that off-duty cops who get in trouble with guns don't seem to, to know about for some reason. Just crazy things they do with a gun. Um, I have a friend who's a, a law professor at Michigan State. We went to law school together in D.C. And uh, his name is Brian Gilmore. And Brian told me that uh, for a while, years ago, he worked at a law firm where they represented union members who got in trouble, police officers in D.C. and firefighters. And he listened to me talk about my research with officer-involved domestic violence, and he said, you know, it's an interesting thing. I represented tons of cops who got arrested for domestic violence crimes, but never a firefighter. And I think that's quite telling because uh, officer-involved domestic violence is a huge problem. It's another area where women, uh, spouses, partners, don't feel comfortable calling the police if they've been um, uh, assaulted by their husband or their partner or significant other. It's, it's a really a troubling thing, but there's a lot of officer-involved domestic violence, and it's something that agencies are starting to take note of and to try to figure out how to deal with. One of the problems with officer-involved domestic violence 
is that the officers quite often live in different jurisdictions from where they work. Sometimes the agencies don't find out about it. And again, we've got these Lautenberg Amendment problems where you can't carry a firearm if you've been convicted of a qualifying misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. You can, as a police officer, if you have a protection order against you, you can get the judge to write an exception that you're allowed to carry your gun at work, which I think is a really weird thing. But anyway, um, so the other thing we've done in terms of looking at violence-related crimes, looked at the criminal misuse of tasers, conductive energy devices. And what we found in the cases where officers get in trouble for misusing a taser, they tase each other, they tase homeless people, they tase handcuffed people, they tase teenagers, which is really good sport. That's a lot of fun. And they tase each other. Uh, and the other people they tase are people who love their lover. So we get these weird love triangles where officers are like uh, uh, showing up when their wife is uh, uh, flagrante il delecto, which is the Latin term. Uh, uh, you know, and all of a sudden they're, they're shooting some guy with a taser while they're in the middle of the act with the officer's spouse. Very, very strange stuff. Um, so that's an odd one there. And the problem there is, I think that if you look at any taser training video on the internet, there's always laughing going on. Cops thinks it's, thinks it's funny to tase each other, right? So somehow the mindset in the training is that it's funny. They don't think it's a lethal weapon. So it seems that tasers are used to teach people a lesson quite often in the street. People who are of no danger uh, to the officer, no threat at all to the officer or anybody else. But it is good sport, apparently, to tase people. Um, here's an interesting thing with the, uh, the officer-involved domestic violence cases. And I wish I could remember why I came up with these variables, but I wanted to look at the differences between cases where an officer misused a department-issued firearm and a personally-owned firearm. And what we found is that the cases where the officers um, committed a domestic violence crime using a personally-owned weapon, they were far more likely to be convicted than officers who committed a crime of domestic violence using a department-issued weapon, as if somehow it's excused that they must have had a reason for uh, gunning down their wife uh, with a department-issued pistol. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I'd be real interested with some of these things like that if you all have ideas what may be going on there. Um, in the cases where officers are charged with crimes of domestic violence, uh, it's rare that they get arrested for simple assault. They're more likely to get arrested in cases such as murder, where they actually killed their significant other, but it's fairly rare. They've got even odds, frankly, if they're going to get arrested for simple, if they're going to get convicted of simple assault once they're arrested. Another thing we looked at was I was interested in correlates of police misconduct. So we had a way that we could go into the federal court's database called PACER, the Public Access to Courts Electronic Record System, and run every one of the names. So as, as Rob Bogoyevich, the former governor of Illinois, would say, I had this thing that was golden, to, to, uh, to, you know, to paraphrase Bogoyevich, and that's this master list of officers who'd been arrested. So we ran every one of their names through the PACER database to see if at some point in their career they had been sued civilly for violating somebody's civil rights. And what we found is that 24% of the cases, arrest cases, involved an officer who at some point had been sued in federal court for violating somebody's civil rights. So we don't know how often cops get sued in federal court, or local court even, if they're uh, not arrested at some point during their career. But we don't have a list of those names, so it's kind of hard to tell. And then the last thing I want to mention is, and this is one of the earliest findings that I came up with in my research, and that is, prior research would suggest that if an officer is going to get in trouble, whether it's some sort of misconduct that's not criminal or whether it's criminal misconduct, corruption, whatever it is, it's going to be early in their career. It's going to be the three to five year mark maybe, and then they're going to uh, just sort of write it out if they stay in their job, write it out to the end of their career, or they're going to get out of law enforcement. But we found something different, and it's hard to see on this chart, but we found is that um, we see spikes in officers getting arrested within three years of retirement eligibility. So we see this spike of about 18 to 20 years, 23 to 25, 28 to 30, and even 33 to 35 years of service. There's something about the end of a career with losing that badge, the idea that you're going to lose your firearm is, you know, is, uh, with the badge, I don't know. Um, there's something going on there, we're not sure what it is, but about 20% of the cases uh, the officers are arrested with 18 or years service, 18 or more years of service as a law enforcement officer. So that's something that's, that's really interesting and it's a unique finding in this research. 
So I want to open it up to questions. I'm sure people have some things they want to talk about. Uh, I will mention that we have a podcast. It's available on iTunes. It's called Police Integrity Lost. I put a, a new issue up about once a month. And there's also a URL here if you're interested in learning about my research or reading some of the papers at bgsu.edu slash police integrity lost. Yes, sir. Did you ever arrest a colleague? Um, no. I, um, I do have a recollection of driving um, a sergeant home in lieu of arresting him. Um, a very drunk sergeant. I do remember that. I have, a, uh, I have, as a lawyer, represented officers who were charged with crimes. I've also uh, represented officer, one officer who was uh, at least accused in some sort of conspiracy theory of somehow uh, being involved in a cover-up involving Vince Foster's death, uh, the officer who found Vince Foster's body. But good question. No, I never arrested another officer. You talk about uh, violence against teens. Are you, uh, I don't know if it's just a New Hampshire I'm sorry, thing. I didn't hear that. Violence what? Violence against teens. Teens, yeah. By police. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, a program, at least it's in New Hampshire, uh, called Police Explorers, kind of like uh, Cub Scouts for, uh, for the police. And uh, does that, is that part, is that a national thing? And is it uh, possibly well, connected? Well, we have um, Sam Walker, who's a retired professor, Professor Emeritus at the University of Nebraska, uh, wrote a paper about, 12, 13 years ago, where he identified a problem where law enforcement officers sexually abused teenagers in the Law Enforcement Explorers program, the scouting program, and we actually have been tracking that, and we have an alarming number of cases in my database where officers are arrested for crimes where they sexually coerce, sexually abuse, in some cases flat out rape, uh, teenagers who are involved in the Law Enforcement Explorers program. And if you're not familiar with the Explorers program, it's a part of scouting, and it's the only part of anything affiliated with Boy Scouts of America where there's an exception to the rule now that you have to have at least two adults for any activity involving scouts. The only exception to that is in the Law Enforcement Explorers program where you have cops with kids on ride-alongs. So think about it. You've got an officer who's out there with a 15 or 16-year-old girl. She goes on multiple ride-alongs with the officer. Sometimes bad things happen. Not always, but sometimes they do, and it's a strange, it's a strange thing. Is that what you were talking about, those types of things? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. uh, one of the funding sources for the uh, police explorers is uh, civil asset forfeiture. Some of the monies in this state go from asset forfeiture into programs like that. Yeah, and, and civil asset forfeiture, by the way, was something I first learned about in 1986 uh, as a police officer in Dover, New Hampshire, when it dawned on me that the drug cases that our police department was targeting, that the police chief was actually involved in himself, were the cases where the police chief had identified a vehicle that he wanted to seize and have forfeited to the department. And we actually had a garage where they hid these vehicles. And I remember one was a, um, it was a Lincoln uh, limousine and another was a Porsche that he had under tarps that he kept there waiting for them to get cleared through the courts so that he could drive them around. Any other questions? Um, thank you so much again for coming. <clears throat> so she wants to ask um, about open sourcing the research. Are you open to kind of uh, public input on developing the database, basically? Yeah, well, there's several things about that. Under the um, condition of the federal grant, by the way, I should point out I was on the first slide that my research is funded by the National Institute of Justice at the U.S. Department of Justice, and obviously the opinions, conclusions, recommendations, or opinions are those of me alone and not necessarily those of the Department of Justice. That being said, the Justice Department has never told me what to do. They've never interfered with our research. And they've only asked me one question. They wanted to know a few years ago if we'd seen a spike in officers arrested for heroin-related crimes. So, um, and that's something we're still looking into. But um, uh, interesting point. Now I forgot your question. Uh, or her question. Uh, open sourcing. Oh, open source. So a condition of that grant, which is what got me thinking about the grant, um, we're required to deposit our data set for statistical analyses with the National Archives of Criminal Justice data at the Inter-University Consortium of Political and Social Research, which is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And we've done that, uh, but that's been stripped down of the names. Any unique identifiers have been redacted out of that data set, and it has not been made publicly available yet. 
Um, and I don't know if it will be available on the internet or if it's going to be a restricted use data set where you'd have to have special permission to use it with certain conditions because it's, it's hard to strip out the names, the unique identifiers. Sometimes you can, if you know, for example, it was an officer, um, you know, for example, there was a major in the New Hampshire State Police who was arrested a week or two ago. How many majors in the New Hampshire State Police get arrested? You know, if we've got the rank and everything, it's hard to tell. But some people are asking, do we actually have, will we make available all these articles and things like that. And if that's your question, uh, there's several things about that. My university, under the Institutional Review Board, really wants us to treat this as human subjects research and to not publish the names. And I think the Justice Department, well, I know that they asked us to do that as well. That being said, though, they did not have any trouble at my decision to give up names to the Washington Post for those 54 names in that study we did with the Post. So it's something that we're we're still trying to flesh out. The other thing about crowdsourcing is that we would like to figure out a way so that people can get uh, information to us because we realize that we don't capture every case. We have 1,100 or so cases a year. We have almost 11,000 cases in our database now, but we don't capture every single case where an officer is arrested. So we do need to put some thought with a Dropbox or something on the internet where people can provide us with information. Does that answer her question? Okay, thank you. So I had my own uh, yeah. question, which was um, whether you have a variable in the database for whether the charges were ultimately dropped, mm -hmm. and if so, um, what percentage of law enforcement arrests did result in charges being dropped, and how that compares to the percentage of arrests in the general population uh, that are ultimately dropped? Um, it, de it depends on the crime and the type of crime. So if it's an on-duty sex crime, police sexual violence, those are more likely to result in conviction. Um, by the way, the drug crimes are primarily on-duty crimes. The profit-motivated crimes are typically on-duty. Police women are more likely to commit a profit-motivated crime. Sex crimes and uh, violence-related police crimes are both on-duty and off-duty. And typically, alcohol-related crimes are off-duty, although about 11% of our cases involve on-duty officers who are arrested for DUI. So. 11% um, of the DUI cases. So we do have uh, various variables on conviction data, um, and it varies by the type of crime, but that's something we're actually looking into very closely. Uh, a colleague of mine, Steve DeMuth, who's an expert on sentencing, uh, is, is working with me this summer with one of his grad assistants where we're looking at some of the sentencing data that we've been collecting, which is really hard to track. Um, but yeah, um, I thought when I went into this that if a police officer got arrested, they lost their job. Uh, and that they probably got convicted, and it's just not the way it is. So um, police officers are part of what we call the courtroom work group. In other words, the people who work in courts every day, the judges, the defense lawyers, the prosecutors, and it really screws, thing up, screws things up for the courtroom work group if you're dealing with a defendant who's a police officer because other officers may become less cooperative with the prosecutors. So there's a lot of variables there. It's things we're still trying to... Uh, sort out, and it's something that we're just getting into publishing that all these years into it now, working with the uh, the conviction data and the sentencing data. But we do look at that in all the studies. Uh, conviction. We we stop looking at conviction data and job loss in the same studies because they predict each other, and uh, that's kind of a weird thing. Nobody ever called me out on that, but it it, it doesn't it doesn't help, sir. Sure. This question veers a little bit. Um, Whenever a police officer discharges his weapon on the job, he's required to fill out a report. However, there's no universal report or no, no database throughout the country to collect this. Um, do you know of any effort to, to make a single database to collect shootings? Um, yes, but I'm not allowed to speak to it. Um, I do consulting work for the Justice Department, and um, there are some and I'm not allowed to talk about the specifics of that, unfortunately, but there are efforts um, at a few places across the country now where researchers are trying to develop that type of database. And there's a question whether the government's going to fund it. Frankly, it comes down to whether these studies are, um, you know, of sufficient methodological rigor, I suppose. So there's some interest in that. There are some crowdsource projects that are looking at those types of things, but specifically as to your question, just discharging a weapon, um, frankly, I think in some agencies they don't do a good job of keeping that data, right? They don't, they don't fill out the reports quite often or they don't do so honestly, but that's a tough one. Um, there are a few departments around the country that 
have some good data on that, and there are some researchers that are looking at that. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my question is uh, in regards to cop block. If you are familiar with cop block and uh, what you think about it in terms of a, a movement or a police accountability uh, measure, I think um, I think any sort of data that's developed on police misconduct is a good thing. I am. Uh, concern. There is a project uh, that the Cato Institute now runs, and it has a funny name. It's the National Police Misconduct Reporting Project, and it was started, um, I just forgot his name, David, um, can't think of his name right now. But the guy, what? What? Say again? No, 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 I can't think of his name right now. Uh, but his guy out in Seattle who started this project back around 2000 and... Uh, nine, I think, and he ended up giving it up and the Cato Institute took it over. And I'm not sure of how they um, collect their data, but it's, it's, it's internet-based stuff, news sources. And one of the problems I have with it is we're not too clear what their unit of analysis is. In other words, in my research, everyone's been arrested, so there's been a probable cause finding that they committed a crime. And I'm not sure how you define police misconduct if it's real broad where you're trying to collect data on it. But I think that any sort of a project, Pac-Man's his name, by the way, David Pac-Man. Um, uh, any project, any crowdsource type thing, any uh, ground, uh, grassroots project where you're developing data on misconduct and crime by police officers, I think it's a good thing. Especially in light of the fact the government doesn't collect any of this data. Yes? Uh, one of the things that you had spoken about was the types of crime that police officers typically commit. Those crimes being um, you said financially motivated or crimes against like, uh, their spouses or teens or mm -hmm. children. Uh, one of the things that is a hot button issue right now is the question of racially motivated police crimes against people who are of a different race. And so I was wondering if you had access to data on that or if you've ever, ever spoken on that or if that's something that you've ever considered looking into as a part of. So it seems to be like a power issue. If they feel like oh, they absolutely. have the power to do it, they will. And if they feel like they could get away with it, they would. Well, the problem right now is everybody's a videographer, right? Because everybody's got a smartphone in their pocket. So that seems to be changing things. And what we're finding, um, you know, just in the last few months, people are realizing something I've known for many years. Um, there's actually a New Hampshire State Supreme Court case that I'm quoted in where we dealt with a similar issue uh, back in the early 1990s. Um, you know, police officers engage in what we referred to when I was a Dover police officer as creative report writing at times. And sometimes the reports don't jive with what really happens. So the, the, the cell phone video, the smartphone videos are, are really important. In my database, we do track um, race of the officer. And we started doing that about five years ago when a graduate assistant of mine came to me and said that I think you're missing the boat. First of all, every criminologist tracks race when you can. But also, he thought that we had it in our data, which is one of the reasons we're capturing these videos now. Uh, we've got about 4,000 videos. But we haven't figured out a way to capture the, the race of the victim, and that's one of the limitations of my data set. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. I believe this should be our last question. Okay. How are you and your work received by fellow officers? Oh, um, well, I don't have too many friends uh, <laughs> in certain occupations, I'd say. Um, Last week, I was in Washington, D.C. at the Justice Department, and, and we recorded a video. Apparently, the National Institute of Justice has a YouTube channel, which I'm not familiar with. But anyway, one of the things that we made a point of in this video, and it was something that the people who work with me at NIJ wanted me to make very clear, is that my research is not anti-policing. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do is improve the quality of law enforcement officers' lives and law enforcement families. That's one of the reasons we're looking at domestic violence, among other things. Um, so it's, it's not anti-law enforcement. On the other hand, I've been privy to a lot of pretty egregious police misconduct over the years, and it's something that I think is worthy of being studied. So I was shocked when we actually were awarded an NIJ grant back in 2011 at Bowling Green. Um, and I've been, you know, I don't know, friends of mine have suggested that I not speed through you know, places, but I don't think that people really pay a whole lot of attention to me. Um, I don't, uh, I no longer drink in bars with police officers though, because I find that, um, you know, usually we end up in arguments. But 
I, I'm glad you asked the question because it's not, it's not anti-law enforcement. So again, um, this has been a lot of fun. As I mentioned at the beginning, I uh, spent my summers up here as a kid, about 10 miles from here, and I really like this area a lot, and it's nice to come back to the North Country. So I appreciate the invitation, and I'll be around if anybody has any other questions or want to talk this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.